I, uh, I've had the good fortune to be on this stage doing a, a bunch of these different programs, but I gotta say I'm honestly more excited about this than anyone I've been a part of in the past. Um, the qu question of misinformation in our society is something that as a journalist really concerns me. As a democracy, how do we even function if we don't agree to what's going on in the world? And misinformation is really kind of polluting the environment. So I can't stress how crucial this topic really is, and hopefully we're going to be able to dive into it. And plus, this panel is just amazing. When I heard that David Mickelson from Snopes was going to be here, I thought, oh, they're flying this guy in from Washington, D.C. or wherever he is. He's down in Tacoma, I found out, from reading the, the Seattle Times article. And so it's great to have him in the area. It's wonderful to have him on this panel. Also next to him, Jevin West. You might have heard about his class on disinformation, which is calling bullshit that went viral a couple years ago. He was just telling me it's just as popular, and in fact, it's spreading to other parts of the country. And then Kate Starbird, who focuses on the misinformation that spreads during disasters, is just doing some incredible work. And also, I just had to put a bug in her ear about basketball. You might not know, but she was also a huge star at Stanford playing basketball and played for the Storm. So uh, thanks to all of you for being here. And I just wanted to start out by having you talk a little bit about why this topic of misinformation animates you. Like, why do, are you interested in it? And then a little bit about how you engage with the topic. David? Oh, OK. Uh, people in the back hear me, so we know that these work. OK. Um, well, of course, I'm engaged with this topic because it unexpectedly became my job. Uh, you know, I started out back in the mid-1990s kind of as a hobby gone awry, uh, you know, writing about urban legends, and we just kind of became the go-to place where everybody sent anything questionable they came across on the internet, and you can imagine how the amount of questionable stuff has grown in the last 20 years, so we're kind of on the, you know, the front lines and the trenches up to our waist and muck, uh, fighting misinformation every day. And you were telling me that although it used to be, I, I recall when I first went to it, it was to dispel urban legends, and these yeah. days there is so much stuff in politics that it's kind of taken over. Snopes. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> well, in the sense of the effect it has on, on our democracy, and also a lot of it's not really that interesting. It's just, you know, a lot of the same stuff over and over and slight variations. <laughs> Jevin, what interests you about this topic in general? And then tell us a little bit about how you engage with the topic. Yeah, so I got in this because I have this love affair with science. So several years ago, before the real fake news uh, epidemic, well, it's been around forever, but at least the term and sort of the, com the commonness of this term uh, in everyday language and in the newspapers every day, my colleague and I were really concerned about what was going on in science. So there's a good thing going on in science right now. There's this open access movement. So the, the knowledge that you're paying uh, my salary, your tax dollars paying my salary and other scientists jobs to do good science and get knowledge out has been locked in these subscription-based journals. And these journals, you have to be a part of the university. And we've seen this open, um, the, this open sort of open access movement that has now created all these predatory journals. So we have sort of a fake news problem in science where it looks sciencey, but it's not science. And so that led me into starting to study this specifically in science. And of course, then the uh, 2016 election happened, and then everything has sort of changed since then. So we've sort of spread to what we've looked at as well. Sciencey, like truthy. Yeah, truthy, <laughs> sciencey. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Kate Starbird, like what? Why are you interested in this topic? And tell us a little bit about how you engage with the topic. Yeah, so well, we started out studying um, a few years ago, back when I was a PhD student at University of Colorado, we were studying uh, the use of social media during disaster events. And we were actually looking at all the like really great and amazing things that happened where people tried to come together and help each other and help you know, their neighbors and help people halfway across the world um, in the wake of these disaster events. and. Over time, we started seeing, you know, these conversations about, oh, there's a lot of misinformation in the system. There's, you know, we talked to emergency responders, and they said, oh, we don't want to use that, we don't trust it. And I was like, well, we're not, you know, we're not really seeing that much, much misinformation, but over time, we began seeing more and more, and then we started seeing intentional misinformation, which we call disinformation, and then 
like Jevin, 2016 happened, and we were like, holy moly, we're actually seeing these intentional campaigns of disinformation that are happening after crisis events that are trying to take advantage of people. I, I, we've always had misinformation and false information out there. Uh, I guess I'm going to ask the challenge question, the premise of this whole thing is, um, are we seeing just a degree of difference? There's a whole lot more disinformation out there, which could be explained by the fact that there's a lot more information out there. Or are we seeing a difference in not just quantity, but kind? Is it a kind of difference of in misinformation that we're seeing today? David? Well, um, I always like to say that technology changes, human nature not so much. So a, a lot of it is just the same old thing we've been seeing for many years, just slightly different in form or spread. Um, there are certain technological factors, of course, that you can get stuff out there faster and wider than ever before. But I think there has been a significant shift in that um, we're seeing like kind of the erosion of some institutions, like the the internet eliminated, you know, some of the middlemen, the gatekeepers, which is maybe nice for things like buying and selling stocks. You don't have to go to a broker. You can just do it online, not pay somebody for every transaction. The idea that we got rid of the middlemen in journalism, not so good. It, you know, that kind of like turned into a free-for-all now where anybody can be on the web publishing articles that look like news. And, you know, we've created this morass where now people are questioning whom do we trust and don't even see, you know, the New York Times or see CNN is reliable, so. Um, and, and yet, uh, it, we all, people have always found been skeptical about mainstream media outlets. Kate, do you think we're seeing just more misinformation, or is this really a, a difference in kind? I think there's a difference. I mean, there's there's many differences about the way we consume information, where we see it, who we see it from, and and how we're able to sort of the heuristics that we've had in terms of how we in, interpret the information we see have have been totally disrupted by this new way of giving us information where we we can't really know if that um, where that information came from there are things that look like they're from the Seattle Times or the Seattle Post and they're from you know uh, people that are trying to deceive us whether for political reasons or financial reasons so there's 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 all of these different sort of factors that have to do with how we're seeing information and how it's sort of mediated by technology that I think are, are playing into um, uh, this kind of rise of, of misinformation I don't think it's just in amount, it's mm -hmm. it's a, it's not just in the, the amount of misinformation we're seeing or disinformation we're seeing. It's in how we see it, how it's wrapped in our social systems. It's not just that we're seeing it, um, you know, on the news. We're seeing it from our aunt Judy on her Facebook feed, which is a very different way of getting uh, of having in information uh, delivered to us. And so, um, a lot of the ways that we're just used to to making judgments about information are being broken by this new way of distributing distributing it. That's certainly true. Your Aunt Judy, my Uncle Harry, we're always kind of full of it. But when we can talk about it today, there's so much more information available, Jevin. Is there any real evidence that a larger proportion of everything we can consume is misinformation? Well, I mean, that's something that Kate and others, and, and even we're trying to do in our lab, is try to figure out how to do that. Sorry for the feedback. I don't know if it's going through each microphone. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe I can speak really loud. Um, do I don't need the mic? Is that better? Eat the mic. Eat the mic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just say this. I think there's two. There's two. Th uh, sorry. There's two things that I see that are different nowadays. I think one that we can counterfeit people now. So this ability to go and think that you're being followed by lots of people, or you're someone that wants to show how influential you are, so you can have lots of people following you or liking the things that you do. And those can be done algorithmically, and also those same algorithms that are sort of optimizing one really important thing, and that's keeping you on the platform. And so the way the algorithm starts to learn is say, hey, I think if I give you this divisive video or this video that's uh, you know, conspiracy laden, you're maybe more likely to watch that. And so as these algorithms get smarter and the ease in which it is to, to counterfeit people, um, that sort of changes the way that we sort of look at, look at this. 
so that's the it, the signals that we get about information are are first of all they're different signals and second of all they can be gamed they can be manipulated in ways that they couldn't be manipulated before and i don't know if we explained algorithms yet but the computer oh. programs that control the platforms which are the social media sites that we go to um, those computer programs can actually um, they work in ways that are not that are not transparent to us as users and they distribute information to us and they can be gamed by people they can be taken advantage of by by people for money or for political reasons to distribute content to us in ways and so we've got all of these factors hitting at the same time uh, in in new ways where um, individually we're vulnerable the platforms are vulnerable they don't know what to do about it our Lawmakers are vulnerable. They don't know what to do. Well, vulnerable. We can talk about that, but they don't know what to do about it, um, and so they're also taking advantage of it. But that's another story. Well, counterfeiting people. There's a really scary video out there of Obama, former President Obama, speaking, where the words have been literally put in his mouth, and you watch the video, and you're sure he's saying that. So yeah. much for seeing is believing. That's right, and that actually came out of the University of Washington and Adobe Research, so it makes <laughs> me a little nervous, or, you know, well, I, I kind of feel a little guilty that it's coming out of University of Washington. But yeah, for those that haven't seen this, we've been worried for years and years about photoshopping f photographs and being able to counterfeit photographs that way, but now there is technology available and it's only going to get better where you can counterfeit voice and video, and that's something we should be really it's, it's worried about. It's amazing. You should definitely check it out. David, did you want to jump in there? No, I'm familiar with what he's talking about, yeah. you know, the deep fakes, as they call it. Um, deep fake. Yes. <laughs> At least for now, there are still ways of detecting it. Uh, I don't know if they will hold up in the future, but um, a lot of people are, of course, already jumping ahead of, the, of that issue and knowing that this is coming, trying to find ways to be able to, you know, distinguish the fake from the real as the technology gets better. Um, what's the most egregious piece of misinformation you've seen, and let's just say since noon? Um, since noon. <laughs> or, or just something that you saw or heard uh, or we read. We should put that out to the crowd. <laughs> right, right. We'll, we'll get to that. Actually, when you get to ask questions, I want you to answer that question. But just maybe something that just really stood at you that maybe just annoyed you more than anything or, or for, some, for some reason struck you as particularly horrible. David? Since noon? <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be since noon. Just something that, just something that like, I realize going back, it'd take a long time to think of the worst, but something that stands out. Well, just in general, it's on one of the slides, the whole Pizzagate conspiracy theory. I mean, just because, for one thing, it's it's has no connection to reality whatsoever. I mean, a lot of misinformation is a distortion or a spinning of something that actually happened. But the idea that Hillary Clinton and other Democrats are running a child sex trafficking ring out of the basement of a pizza restaurant that has no basement I mean, is <laughs> utterly, completely not grounded in any reality whatsoever. But that story was so huge, and the worst Part of it is maybe you can tamp down that story, maybe you can demonstrate to people that it's fake, but the fact that so many people are willing to consider and believe that this could actually be happening is a symptom of the much larger problem that we have to deal with. I, Jevin, I've seen you talk about this, and it's not the whole concern about Pizzagate is not even over. People still no. believe that that's Yes, going. people, families are still protesting on the White House lawn that it's even larger cover-up now that Alex Jones has apologized because of potential lawsuits that we're following. And actually had my students just last week they said, no, people can't possibly believe this. And they're not, they're, there's no more people talking about it. Are, are they? So they went online and they found these forums that they're still talking about it within like a couple hours of when they had looked at the post. But I think in the last 12 hours, one thing that we played in our class was uh, four degrees of Alex Jones. And so this, for those that aren't familiar with Alex Jones, he's the one that's promulgated things like Pizzagate and many conspiracy theories. He's the one that was kicked off Twitter and Facebook. And the idea is you, you play a game, you go to Google, you start at any, or YouTube, you started any video and you see within four clicks if you can get to any Alex Jones conspiracy video <laughs> on uh, and the students were pretty good at it actually we got to five we didn't go quite to four but we were we were um, it was pretty effective that shows how bad um, you know our, our 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 video and our information environments are if you can get to these conspiracy videos from any other video on the internet Kate your focus is disasters is there something that kind of stands out to you that particularly was horrific to you um well, let me not answer your question. Let me go back to, to these other ones. Um, well, that is so polite to say I won't answer. 
I'm just going to be honest. Um, no fake news for me today. Um, no, the, uh, one of the things that we say, saw in our disaster research is it started to converge onto some of these other conspiracy theories. And so we actually did a, we ended up doing a whole study on conspiracy theories that um, were happening during disaster events. And one of the things that was most troubling, and this is true of the Pizzagate as well, wasn't the theories themselves, because at first those seemed very marginal um, stories that the Navy SEALs had done the 2013 um, Boston Marathon bombings, that they were the perpetrators, right? Um, so I guess I did answer your question. Sorry, I got around to it. Um, but that was one of the first things. We were like, what is, what is this? Um, but what was weird was over time how those theories started to come out of the mouths and Twitter accounts of people in power. So it wasn't that, you know, it, the, the theories themselves were weird. I mean, they're weird, they're marginal, and, 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 and it's okay if a few people in society, um, you know, care about that and they think that's their thing. But when, um, you know, Michael Flynn or uh, Donald Trump Jr. starts to talk about Pizzagate in the, and out, out in public or some of these other things, um, it's when, when those conspiracy theories start to come out of people who say they're journalists or um, people who claim, you know, people who have become the, the, the gatekeepers, the new gatekeepers out of this democratization of information. We've got these Alex Joneses and these other people that are distributing this information. And when, when these theories start to rise and be repeated by people that actually have these big audiences, that's, and, and, and not just the big audiences, but they, they also have power in the world. When people in, in power in the world are repeating some of these conspiracy theories, um, that's when it gets frightening to me. Well, also person in power. Let's go right to it. I mean, when we, you've got a president who kind of fairly consistently has been proven to be promulgating falsehoods over and over and over again. Do you think that overlay of that coming from the Oval Office is influencing the larger misinformation and disinformation that's being propagated? What do you think, David? Well, uh, the <laughs> first impulse would have to be, well, of course it is, um, I, although this was a big problem before President Trump got into office, but um, I said it, it's essentially made the term fake news meaningless because now fake news is anything that the President of the United States doesn't like or doesn't agree with and you know now say the Washington Post is on the same level as Alex Jones they're all just fake news um, actually where there's kind of a movement in the in the fact-checking industry if we can call it that to really ditch that term in favor of junk news because a lot of what we call fake fake news isn't actually fake. You can be present the truth and be very misleading if you're just being selective about what you tell people or picking out little bits of information that don't add up to anything to foster a conspiracy theory. But um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's kind of like fostered a sort of malaise or disregard or what is true. People don't care anymore. It's, you know, well, we can't know what's true, so you know, I don't know what to believe. So so I just won't try anymore. Has the disregard for the truth from the nation's president promulgated this throughout our society? What do you think, Jevin? Yeah, well, we're seeing it with other leaders across the world, too. Duarte um, has been a leader that's used the fake, ter fake news term almost as much as Trump, maybe even more so. And there's, there's countries like Malaysia that are now convicting people of fake news writing and being thrown in jail, and that's scary. I mean, and actually, even countries that we would consider, you know, Western democracies like France and Sweden have started to develop laws against us. So the government's getting involved with this sort of fake news, um, you know, you know, its role in society and if there should be legal laws. I'm personally against having a law, even though as much as I don't like fake news, I'm really worried a little bit about these these laws because of the slippery slope to first uh, of the First Amendment. But I will say this about, you know, y y we do miss use the term fake news and in, in academia too we're trying to be more careful with it but I will say there's all sorts of other kinds of news too fake news is you know if you had to sort of come up with a definition it's sort of fabricated it's sort of not true whereas um, things like hyperpartisan news sort of fits in a similar category but it's of actual events and that's harder to distinguish when you're in hyperpartisan news then those are actual events that are sort of hard sometimes to sort of distinguish between whether they're fake or not. So it's something to consider. Kate, do the distortions we see coming out of the White House on a pretty consistent basis influencing the overall atmosphere when it comes to misinformation? You know, it's hard for me to, to determine and, and say with a strong conviction whether that is a symptom of the problem, um, whether 
whether that is someone who's strategically using disinformation against the population, or whether that's a person who actually believes some of these things. And um, it may be all three of those. Um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily a cause as much as a uh, result of the, the kind of rise of disinformation as well as sort of a conduit. Um, there, there are tactics of disinformation that can be tied to sort of historical strategic strategies and um, they seem to be being employed by people uh, in, in power in the US and in power in other places uh, around the world. As Jevin said, this is on the rise um, all over the world right now. Yeah, it kind of, as Jevin suggested, it's unfortunate uh, that here and other places like Western Europe, they've sort of been looking at maybe you should address this problem legislatively and pass laws. And but there are countries where they've done that and then use those laws to throw journalists in jail, to actually having the exact opposite, uh, you know, effect of what was intended, and lock up the people who are trying to get out the good news, the legitimate news. So it's it's a very tough issue to address, you know, through through law. David, you were telling me that your staff has really grown. By the way, Kate, please eat your dinner. You know, <laughs> is, is it okay if we snatch some French fries once in a while, please? <laughs> but, but David, um, yeah. your staff has grown tremendously, but how do you keep up? There's such an incredible flow, and you're trying to debunk things. There's so much coming your way. How do you... Well, I suppose the answer to that is we don't actually keep up. I mean, we can only address a small percentage of what's out there. I mean, even with a staff a thousand times the size, I mean, we, we try to tackle every day what's most prominent out there, what most people are looking at, questioning, asking about. But, you know, it's, you know, like <laughs> pushing the rock uphill every day and then, you know, at the end of the day, rolling back down to the bottom and starting over again. Do you find yourself at Snopes the subject of attacks by people like the main like the mainstream media is under attack and you're yes. trying to debunk falsehoods. So yes. are you suddenly subject to all kinds of attacks from people because they don't think your corrections are correct? Oh yeah. Well you know, we get all the usual accusations of bias. Um, and of course there are just the <laughs> fake articles attacking us personally because I've read on the internet in <laughs> in recent months that uh, I run a dog fighting ring that I <laughs> um, I spent a bunch of money we got through a GoFundMe on a yellow Ferrari. Um, All right, we're going on that after. after right? <laughs> yes. uh, I, I learned, much to my surprise and delight, that I work for the CIA. Um, you know, <laughs> every day's a new adventure. But, um, yeah, but you know, it, it, it's you know the common technique is if you you know you can't you come across you know, a, a debunking that you don't like, it's because it contradicts something you want to believe. If you can't, if you can't fight the facts, then try and discredit the source. And so that's kind of another thing our president has unfortunately kind of fostered, you know. You've been doing this for a long time, David, but yes. I wonder, Jevin and Kate, are you experiencing pushback from people who say that your kind of reveal of misinformation is in itself disinformation? Do you get any of that? Kate? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so one of the techniques of disinformation is to, to try to discredit the, the, those who would kind of call it out. And, and so there's like den dis deny, discredit, um, yeah, there's, a, there's a whole, there's a, there's a list of Ds, you can go look them up, the four Ds, but I'm forgetting them right now, that's because I had half a beer. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but one of those things is discredit. And so when, when the people that would, would gain from spreading disinformation about a particular thing see you as a threat, they will try to discredit you. And one of our first sort of systematic um, analyses of disinformation, um, we were looking at conspiracy theories of crises event, crisis events, and we saw all these different themes, and attacking Snopes was one of the top 30 themes that we saw, because <laughs> they saw Snopes as a threat to what they were trying to do, which was spread disinformation, and so and if you can't fight it, if you can't deny it, if that's not working, you discredit the source. And so you see that, we've seen that, I'm not going to list the examples politically that we're seeing right now, but that 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 is a, a tactic of disinformation and one of the end goals of disinformation is to sort of delegitimize journalism because then there is there is no source that are going to hold those these folks accountable and so when when people are equating journalism with fake news that is this example of de of trying to delegitimize um, uh, sources that could hold 
um, those who are spreading disinformation accountable. And Snop Snopes is, an, is another example. And yes, I've experienced it. Um, we let it kind of roll off. Uh, I try not to engage it directly because you just can't win on it. Um, you just got to kind of absorb it, laugh it off, and and move on and, and keep keep doing your thing. I'm just waiting to be accused as, of, of being part of the CIA. But there is a video about me which is really fun. Um, but I don't go watch it because it'll drive up their numbers, and it's not it's not that good. Not uh, that Jevin, good. are you finding people saying that your class about bullshit is bullshit? No. Well, yes, for sure, for sure. On that, it's usually my students telling me, which is a great actually. That's my favorite of all being uh, called called out on. What's I am actually surprised that I haven't been called out more. And, and I think part of it um, is, you know, we're, we're teaching classes um, and we're trying to address, you know, we make fun of everyone, that helps. So we make fun of the left, we make fun of the right. We have examples, anytime we have an example from right media, we'll pull some things from left media too. And our focus is a little less emotional tinge. We really focus on the fake news that's wrapped in data and statistics. And so that kind of helps diffuse it. But I certainly have had events, like I was up in Vancouver a week or, a week or so ago, and during the community event, someone stood up and, and really was sort of expressing their anger uh, about the fact that we didn't weren't 9/11 deniers with them um, because they they were calling bullshit on the 9/11 and and we couldn't get the microphone away and, and we've had these kinds of things happen at these events but nothing personally not like w with Kate and, and David I think it's it's you know I've, eventually it's going to come but that's only been online but nothing um, uh, personally attacked. I want to toss out a couple of quotes about misinformation that have been out there for a long time. We were talking about this one, Jevin. There are many variations on it. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. You say that's there's really a lot of truth to that. Yeah, I, I would say um, I have many different versions. The one I use a lot was one of my favorite is Brandolini's asymmetry, bullshit asymmetry principle, which is it's easy to create bullshit, it's hard to clean it up. And that's, that's it's morning of order, uh, orders of magnitude harder to clean it up. And that's so true. Once you, I can, we, we all in here could create a fake news story and one of us probably, it would take off. And But cleaning that up, like the, the Pizzagate or vaccination issues or any of the things that have really spread wildly is a hard thing to, to combat. How about, David, are you ever able to get that truth out there faster than the falsehood traveling around the world? Mm, no. Um, <laughs> I think one of the slides I saw you have back here is that, that fake story from before the election about uh, Pope Francis endorsing Donald Trump for president. And you know, I've seen other news shows where they've used that as an example that the original fake story had, you know, whatever, 300,000 shares and our debunking of it had 6,000. Um, you know, it, it's not just a matter of speed, it's that the original stories are much more interesting and compelling to people. I mean, it's, you know, like, you know, the old saw about, you know, the, you know, the newspaper you know, has a front page story that's wrong, well, the correction runs on page 18 three days later when nobody sees it or paying attention anymore, so there's really no way you're going to win that battle, no matter how fast or diligently you work. Darbert, have you ever had a, a victory that, where your truth was able to supersede? <laughs> She's laughing. So one of the things we've been studying for a long time is uh, corrections. Before we were even studying like political things, but just like corrections of misinformation, not even intentional disinformation, just misinformation. And so for a few, well, I still do it actually. Um, as I, I just started testing it out myself on my my Facebook friends is just correcting, you know, that's just not true, or this is whatever, whatever. So I don't make any friends. Um, <laughs> nobody ever says, "Well, thank you. Let me delete this for you." They're always they always say, "Oh, well, I believe it anyways," or "I understand the sentiment," or "I believe the sentiment," or whatever. And so, yeah, it's a pastime of mine is to is to trim my Facebook list by just randomly correcting people. <laughs> Mark, Mark Twain, many of you have been attributed for this. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. You found a lot of in that third category. Yeah, and, and first of all, I'm not that that one's misquoted, but I was telling Russ that actually one of the most misquoted person in the world is Mark, Mark Twain. Twain. <laughs> so watch out when someone says, Mark Twain said, 
go check it and see if it's been he's been misquoted. Um, yeah, so our, our big focus, because this world now is infiltrated with data, it's sort of that's my world, is sort of the big data world, we're we're seeing more of the quarter, let's say more sophisticated BS come in numbers. And so we're trying to teach students and the public how when they see a number, not to be intimidated by it, but to sort of um, sort of be careful. And that's why, you know, 37% of dinner talks like this are, are, are BS, so watch out for this. <laughs> yeah, maybe much higher, that's right, yeah. Um, let's talk about social media. I, I was just reading that for a couple of years, Facebook has been asking independent fact-finding organizations, and is Snopes one of them? Yes, we are. And, and what they've been doing is asking them to identify false and misleading information in Facebook posts. So if you try to post something that they've determined is false in some way, they won't keep you from posting it, but something will pop up and it'll say, do you want to continue? This has been flagged as being something that's problematic at the very least, or perhaps even wrong. Um, has that had any effect at all that you've been able to determine? Well, unfortunately, Facebook knows that better than us, and they aren't exactly uh. forthcoming uh, about things. Um, so I, we assume it has to have some effect, but it also assumes that, to a large part, that people care, uh, which is one of the problems. Um, it's like Jevin said, there's so many times when we debunk something, like, you know, President Obama supposedly said whatever, or, and we debunk it, and the reaction you get is, well, even if he didn't say it, it sounds like something he would say, or, you know, that sounds like something he would do, so it doesn't matter to me, you know, if he actually did it. So, um, <laughs> to a large extent, it, it relies on the audience actually caring that they're spreading misinformation, um, and that it really only stymies the people who are doing it for profit, uh, you know, to, who a need the reach. A lot of this is being promulgated by these huge social media companies, yeah. by technology, can technology kind of lead us back towards less misinformation, or is that just a pipe dream? What do you think, Jeff? Well, I'll just say a couple things about that particular yeah. program that Facebook has. Yeah. There's been some interesting proposals outside of Facebook, because as David said, they're not very transparent about what's going on. It'd be great if they could share that with the rest of the community. But there's some ideas about downweighting people that spread things that they knowingly are, or that they know are false, or that have been flagged, and then they still spread. Some have even gone so far as to say, you get a timeout, just kind of like when you were in first grade or something, you have to go in the corner if you've spread misinformation that, that we know is, yeah, has been debunked. And so, you know, there's lots of nice proposals out there. Now it's up to the, the social media companies to sort of employ some of these new ideas. Could those new ideas work, though, I kind of want to... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think they might improve things. I mean, it, it, we're in just one big ex real-time experiment going on right now. And I think the one thing that has to happen is that society needs to know how much of those users on Facebook and Twitter are fake. And, and I was mentioning this at the beginning, but I remember not too long ago, even within the year, where fa Facebook said, we're gonna delete a few accounts. Yes, we deleted 10 million fake accounts. Well, not too long ago, it sort of fell under the news rug. They deleted approximately a billion, or it was a half a billion or a billion fake accounts within the last six months. That's a lot of fake accounts on, on social media. Um, Kate, what do you think about both the idea that statistics are really being used in a false way, maybe the, as they haven't been done before. And secondly, the, the notion, could these social media companies actually do something significant to reduce the amount of false information out there? So let me answer the second question. Sure. Um, I think these social media companies are in, our, in a hard place. I think it's a very hard problem. Uh, I think they definitely participated in making this problem, uh, making it problem worse. Uh, at this point, I don't think a, a simple, like, they're going to redesign the platform or add a little widget, and that's going to fix what's going on. I think the, the problems not right now are, are pretty profound. Um, I think we're going to need technological improvements. I think we're going to need, as a society, sort of to, to sort of educational improvements. And I don't mean that K to 12. I mean that K to 99. I, I think we all I think we all need to, to do a better job of, of becoming better consumers of this information. Um, yeah, and it... And on top of that, I had something else to say, and it's slipping my mind. But um, I'll probably get get back to it. Okay. Um, now, yeah, I think it's 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 a it's a complex it's a complex. Oh, here's the here's the thing. Um, th this is the one thing that I, I think they keep doing wrong, and it and it makes me a little bit nervous. 
What's happening right now is that the people who use disinformation, misinformation, disinformation, um, are in power all over the all over the world. They're, they're ascendant, and when the platforms do anything to change that, if the platforms actually make changes that are going to improve that, those people are going to claim that the platforms are biased, and they keep doing this. Has happened. This has happened once. It's happened twice. It's happened over and over again for Facebook and other um, platforms, and that is that they're feeling this political pressure. Oh, you're biased towards the left or you're you know you're biased against us when really what they're trying to do is make their platform stronger and they've got to figure out a way not to give in to that political pressure um, which is not about left or right it's not I mean we can talk about oh it's all on the right it's not all on the right it's on the right and the left and in other places in between um, but the people that use disinformation are in power and they're going to claim that they're being they're being discriminated against um, as these platforms are trying to make things better and so that platforms have to do a better job well, you know, as Kate said, I mean, I don't envy their position either because it, it's a very difficult problem in the slippery slope land because it's easy to say well, you should not be giving Holocaust deniers a platform. You should not be giving someone like Alex Jones who claims school shootings are a hoax and the children aren't dead and the, the grieving parents are actors. You shouldn't be giving him a platform. But once you pick off the extremes, where you where do you go from there it's like something like Breitbart well it's often wrong but it's not you know to the same degree it's like hyper partisan news as Jevin says are you gonna are you gonna boot them off uh, from what I've seen a lot of what the social media platforms have been doing has seemed kind of arbitrary at times they're like no we're not gonna we're not gonna kick these people off then when public pressure mounts then they gin up some excuse to kick them off you know and, and leave leave other egregious offenders alone so it, it hasn't been very well worked out well I gotta, I gotta say uh, companies like Google that used to have a slogan of don't do evil. I mean, if we're leaving the policing of misinformation up to these giant corporations, they're not exactly operating in the public interest because they're giant corporations. They're there to generate profits. So I'm wondering if it's at all, granted, they have a lot to lose if they become discredited as a platform, but will economic pressures kind of drive them in the right direction? Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I hope the economic pressures do push them. I mean, Facebook is probably responding because they sort of are bleeding, at least on uh, on the sort of public service campaign side. I would say that there's two things that I would like these technology companies to do. One, come to the table now. Um, it's not that they need, I see them have, you see a need to, you know, regulate every aspect of their business, but knowing something about, you know, the fake accounts, their, their, at least their attempts, and, you know, having a little bit more transparency about what they're trying to do. I think that would be important. The next thing would be to sub potentially question their objective function, and their objective function is to keep you on the platform, and, and you know, that's to make money, and so, uh, you know, from their sense, you know, what other objective is there? I want to keep you on the platform so you see these advertisements, but maybe that's, again, some place where we need, as a society, because they're so important nowadays, to change how we sort of, what they're trying, what those algorithms and what those, um, uh, what the systems are trying to, to maximize instead of keeping you on the platform, maybe other mother, other forms of objective function. A question for each of you, a chance to say something unpopular. We're all sitting here feeling fairly <laughs> smug. Though these poor people, deluded by all this misinformation, <laughs> not us, not us right-thinking progressive Seattleites, we actually know what's going on. Um, should we be smug about it or can you say something that might disprove that notion that somehow or other the falsehoods fall on one side of the political spectrum and not the other? Or if, would you rather not say anything unpopular? No, I, I will say something unpopular. I'll let Kate go first. No, you go first, and I'll. I'll. So um, I, I, I had the chance to grow up in a very small town in Idaho, and I, I have uh, my parents actually still live there, so I get to be the black sheep from Seattle, come you know, <laughs> waddling back into the community, and I get I have the great conversations, and um, it gives me sort of a chance to see the other side and and to, and to engage in conversations. I don't agree with much of you know we have great disagreements, but living in both communities has helped me try to see both sides, and I. I definitely think we 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 have our issues uh, on the left as well. I would say, um, I mean, first of all, I mean, I fall for things all the time. There was a person coming along my neighborhood the other day. I, uh, a biker had run into my car, and he says, "I can fix your car for a hundred bucks." And I thought, "Oh, that's better than the two thousand dollars the the auto shop was going to charge." Try. So he said, "Give me a hundred bucks." So I gave him. A, that's how gullible I was. Um, <laughs> and so, what happened? And it happened. Yeah, I paid him, and it didn't fix the dent in my car. Um, he just put a little wax on it. But uh, I. I 
I, I think that you know some of the issues that I, I'm you know I, I see a lot of and this is controversial within Seattle I know it certainly is but we have a lot of researchers that have really engaged in in this this fight against misinformation around vaccinations um, and that's a real issue in Seattle and I know some people in Seattle even I have friends that you know it's the, their parents I have I'm a parent too and I can see how that could be an emotional issue but I think this is where if you look at the numbers across the country you walk around a Whole Foods. Um, and for long enough, and you're going to find people that are not vaccinating their kids, and I think that that's a kind of um, scary, scary proposition. Kate, you had another example. Um, yes. Yeah, so we've been looking at disinformation. It was targeted disinformation campaigns where state and non-state actors from outside of the U.S. are targeting us in different ways, and it doesn't just fall on the right. I think in the most recent election that they did resonate with the alt-right and the alt-right drifted to center and so right now there is there is some of that happening but misinformation disinformation is it doesn't discriminate and in, in terms of the foreign countries seeking to, to manipulate us we have seen them target um, l uh, conversations that we would classify as left whether it's around um, uh, the Syria the context of Syria where they claim that the white helmets a humanitarian response group are a uh, are a terrorist group uh, that resonates mostly among people on the left, although there's some alt-right on, on there. We also saw the, um, the uh, uh, particularly Russia, their internet research agency, target the Black Lives Matter conversation in the US and their con content resonated there. Um, in, in terms of those who seek to manipulate us, they uh, won't just, they, they don't, they're opportunistic. If it works on the right, they'll go to the right. If it works on the left, they'll go to the left. And we are all vulnerable uh, to this. I have shared misinformation or disinformation that I thought was, was true and then was later made aware that it wasn't. And I think everybody, maybe except for David, he's pretty good at this. <laughs> um, uh, I think well, a lot of us are susceptible to this thing because it appeals to us. It's like we're really mad at something. Um, I have one example that I'd love to tell. Sure. How many of you shared something in, like two weeks ago about that presidential alert? You were so mad that Donald Trump was able to send you a text message through your phone. Be honest. I don't see any hands I, going I see. Up. I was correcting. Okay. I, there's some over here. I was correcting some people online. I was on the, 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 this committee to decide about the emergency alerts back when Obama was president. It was going to be called the presidential alert. It was going to happen whether it was Hillary or Obama or, or sorry, Trump or whoever would have going to be the next president was, that was going to be able to send that alert in that way. And yet I saw all of these left-leaning friends of mine on Facebook just up in arms about it and so mad. And it's just like, that's not, that's not what it was all, that's not what it was all about. We're, and I could see why they were susceptible. It's, mm. it, it, it. David Mickelson? Oh, well, I was just going to say that I didn't actually receive that alert. So <laughs> <laughs> we haven't yet figured out whether that means I am or am not going to be sent to a FEMA concentration. <laughs> 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 okay, um, here's where we do the, the helpful part of the program. First of all, what's your advice for folks who do not want to be taken in? What are, what are some simple things that we should all be doing? David? Don't leave the house ever. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no fail safe, as we've all been discussing. I mean, to, to some extent, you have to have some faith or trust in the whatever sources you get information from because nobody has the time and the resources to exhaustively research every single thing they come across I mean you you know you've got to you know at some point you know <laughs> take a leap a small leap of faith in, in something um, you know I, as I have to say what one of the the single most annoying comments we get from readers is when we spend a lot of time I'm researching something, gathering information, putting together an article and publishing it, and people write to us and they say, I just want to know if this is true or not. I don't want to have to read a bunch of stuff. Um, and <laughs> I kind of think that we've kind of we, uh, skewed a little too far in people claiming they just want facts because facts by themselves are relatively meaningless without interpretation and context. Facts aren't facts, in fact. Well, you know, but, you know <laughs> maybe that too, but you know, as, you know, facts in isolation don't tell you anything by themselves. You know, they, they need context. So, um, but, but as far as advice, you know, I don't know that I have anything you know, <laughs> extremely prescient other than 
you know, there's, you, you should, there's enough information out there for you to get a good idea of what information sources are more credible and reliable than others. So, mm -hmm. you know, stick with the ones that you, that you have some trust in. Jeff, and when people go home yeah. tonight, what's a couple things you'd like them to remember? Okay, so here, here to, yeah, here's a few things, few things I use and I talk to students about if I only have two minutes to tell them. I say, you know, first of all, question your source. Who's telling me this? How do they know it? And what do they have to gain from it? That's a, that was those, are, those three questions are always quite effective. If it sounds too good or too bad to be true, it probably is. That one the students like really run off with and always come with great examples. I would say really work on corroborating and reading horizontally online. That means don't stay on one page. Move across. Fact checkers are the best at this. They never stay on one page. And I would say also if something's emotionally pulling you, be careful because that also could sort of be a red flag. Kate, any advice? So I'll echo that last piece about the emotional. I think I'm nervous about some of the other um, techniques. Uh, because, Why? Because the folks that are trying to spread disinformation know how to take advantage of this. They spread content across multiple sites. So if you go multiple places, you keep finding the same, the, the same kinds of things. Which looks like corroboration, but it's just yeah. the same. If you look at RT, Russia, right. Russia Today, that this is a is primary source of disinformation, their tagline is question more, question more. I think we've got to actually push towards, OK, yeah, if we question everything, that's actually the goal of disinformation, is that you don't know where you can go for trusted information. And this way, I think David's more right is that we have to find um, things we can trust because we don't have time to vet everything ourselves at the same time we do need to slow down we need to tune in to where we're being emo uh, manipulated emotionally and in those cases say okay wait a minute what's going on here but if every time we go encounter information okay what are they trying to do to me what are they how are they trying to manipulate me this can actually lead into some of the mm -hmm. kinds of conspiratorial thinking that that I've been studying and 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 see as kind of a as a way that is a pathway to uh, the goal state of disinformation, is, which is trusting nothing. Well, I loved something that, that you've written or said, Kate, about it often goes that information is targeted at our guts. Yeah. So kind of check that out if you've got an emotional reaction to something. That might be a, a reason for you to challenge it because it maybe is going there on purpose, right? Absolutely. I, I, we, we talk a lot about the things we can do, like, oh, logically, if you're just more logical, you can figure this out. But misinformation, does, or disinformation especially, doesn't just target our logical faculties. It goes, it goes through our emotional, uh, our emotional faculties. Do we have any questions from the audience? And I emphasize questions, <laughs> short, concise <laughs> questions. Uh, you could shout it out, or if you want to come up here and come on the mic. Uh, assuming it, uh, what, it's, what makes... What makes the vaccine, the anti-vaccine person and the uh, child sex ring believer, neither of whom think they're being manipulated, they think they're being, they're independently thinking of it and that they're smarter than everybody else. David, what makes them different than you who debunks these things? What makes the anti-vaxxers different than and, me? And the, and the child sex ring yeah. believer. Different in I'm not quite sure. I understand. Different in what sense? I mean, like why are they wrong and we're right, or just? How did they get there? Oh, how did they get there? So, so how do you try and break that? Uh, well, that, I mean, that gets to an interesting point, and that is, you're talking to someone who has a, what you feel is acting on disinformation. Yes. So, how, I mean, we've talked about what to do ourselves to check that stuff out, but what if you're talking to someone who feels as though they're right and you kind of know that they're not? Well, you know, this is a tough question to answer because one of the things I often say is like we read our email about, you know, people insisting certain things are true or that we're wrong about them. And I sit there thinking, who are these people? Because I never encounter them in real life. Maybe I'm just living in my own filter bubble or, you know, as, as we say, you know, so... Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, for anti-vaccination, I think uh, a lot of that is just driven by people don't want to accept that sometimes bad things happen for no discernible reason, for no plan. People, 
people get diseases, people die, and um, people often resort to the you know um, post hoc ergo you know the the ergo yeah ergopropter hoc that you know because A happened and then somebody died that that must have been the cause and so that, we want a reason yeah I mean like we've seen you know like autism okay people want something to blame autism on what we don't really have a good explanation for what causes it well vaccinations now you've got something tangible you can crusade against it gives you a sense of order that you have some control over the situation that you know there are tangible steps you could be taking um, it's kind of like after 9-11 we saw all these rumors about Osama bin Laden owns an interest in whatever company so boycott you know glamour magazine or whatever shell oil they're all completely rid ridiculous but in, in any case that's kind of the same phenomenon people you know when they're afraid of things they like something that gives them some measure of, of you know feeling that they have control and um, so in, in terms of like the, the, the science medical misinformation I think that's what drives a lot of it Pizzagate again I don't know as I said that's like that's the problem is that even if that's not true that so many people are willing to believe something like that uh, you know I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go you know uh, I don't know what the right term is but just say I'm going to admit, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how people got there. I don't know a way to explain concisely how we got to a point where people could believe in something like Pizzagate. <laughs> Jevin and Kate, how do you talk to people who just are not buying it? Well, and well, and I, I would say that Kate's done a lot of nice work looking at how these people move from one conspiracy to the next. No, I wasn't going to say you do some nice work um, thinking about Pizzagate, but I, 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 it's it's the you know I'm going to let Kate sort of fill in that answer. But I think one of the things that um, we try to do in our classroom at the very beginning is sort of re uh, sort of. Um, replant civics in the classroom and sort of just dialogue because there's some people you just can't convince and so the only way that you can convince them or not even the, it's not even necessarily the oh, it's not the only effective way but it's just to build trust with them as an individual because people behave much differently online trolling newspaper articles and trolling on, on, in any form on the web if you pull those same people out in the physical world they sort of behave differently so I think one thing we can do even if we completely disagree and we have a piece or people that you know really believe vaccinations are linked to autism is to bring them into a, a room and hopefully talk and you know many times nothing will happen but just bringing dialogue and civics back is, is in the physical world might be one way to, to attack the problem. Do you think to add, Kate? No. Um, yeah. So we thought about this problem a little bit. We have seen how people get drawn from one to another, and um, there's a certain there's something that links a lot of the conspiracy theories that we see online together. There's a way of thinking, an epistemology, a way of thinking where you don't trust you don't trust the experts, you don't trust the scientists or the journalists. Um, you've got this special knowledge that somebody gave you, and and you've got this explanation, and it has this sort of epistemic closure, like every everything makes sense. It's a simple explanation for what actually turned out to be very chaotic systems. And and we found that once somebody really starts to not just believe one, but two or three or four of these, it's very hard to reach them. Um, um, and so we're not necessarily sure like we talk about there's a lot of there's a lot of different portals down the rabbit hole but one, but they all kind of lead to the same den once you get to this way of thinking and I haven't yet seen a good explanation for what, how we're going to build ways for some of the people that really believe these things to come to come out maybe if it's, if they just don't believe in vaccines that's one thing but if they start to believe in Pizzagate and the vaccine stuff and flat earth we're not really sure what to do to get them out. But one of the things we can think about as a community is as you see somebody who's starting to go down, is how do we intervene then um, earlier on to kind of help people see that that maybe there's other ways of thinking about the world that might be better. I, I'm, it's a sad kind of defeatist way of thinking, but I'm not sure what to do to help people get out of there. It strikes me that maybe this whole situation tonight is, a, is a, an illustration of false narrative brought out through uh, true facts based on selective use of which facts. And I think, you know, this is statistics. This is how you lie with statistics, right? It's which statistics you use. So we have many examples of the right throwing out crazy things. Pizzagate, right? And that's crazy, right? But I'm, I'm conservative, very conservative. I never heard of Pizzagate. He said it was a huge deal. What's your standard for saying it's a huge deal? I hardly, I mean, I barely heard about it. None of my friends believe in that garbage. So you say it's a big deal. 
But I, I don't get that. So the problem here is you have a, what could be considered a biased narrative based on information that is not presented. Well, okay, facts woven together to create a false narrative. Yeah. Certainly an issue. Yes, this is true, this is true, this is true, but they're woven together to create a false story. How does one combat that? Do you see that? Well, and I can just address the pizza gate. You, you may have never heard it, which is great, but if you study things online and you look at the, the just the usage at these places and, and you know of all the stories, like for example, the Pope endorsed... What, sorry? I've vaguely heard of it. Yeah, so I mean, and, and you haven't, that's great. It's not that every person in the world has ever heard of Pizzagate, but if you look at the usage at these social media sites, if you look at the most shared story, that, you know, at least according to some of these places that have done the studies, the Pope endorsing Trump, for example, was the most shared false story. Now, that's not, and it's not that there, there's only on the right. It, it, like we've said from the beginning, it happens on the left as well. So, I mean, I think, you know, Pizzagate being a big deal is just, you know, based on data that we've collected online uh, looking at research. I, I'm not sure how, how, how that's uh, a false narrative. Yes, question. Well, it, it was a combination of, of all the examples were on one side of the ledger minus the one. So the, the idea was yeah. all, all of those examples that were given were on one side of the ledger. No, vaccinations is very much a left issue. Yeah, and I, and I, would, I would be careful. Um, one of the things we're finding in a lot of the research and I, th and I, th I, I push back against this narrative a lot. When I say, when you ask me if I get harassed, and I was like, yes, most of the people that have harassed me have been on the far left rather than the far right for the research that we've done because it often implicates people on the, on the far left. And what I would say is actually what we've seen is a lot of misinformation and disinformation resonate on those edges. We're not talking about mainstream con conservative. We were talking about what became the alt-right. Well, the alt-right has drifted into the mainstream by, but for some various reasons. But if you look at 2016, misinformation and disinformation were, were mostly kind of uh, were concentrated among these people that felt very strongly one way or the uh, another, and that made them particularly vulnerable to this kind of this kind of manipulation. And and then the thing that I that I think was most disconcerting was to see people that were gaining power on the right started to repeat these things. Pizzagate was repeated by Mike Flynn, Mike Flynn's son, talk about this on, on their social media accounts. Mike Flynn, this was, this was as he was going into power in the Trump administration, not, not after, it was before. And so those are the kinds of things that, that made us nervous. And I wouldn't say this is a conservative issue. This is an issue of a very weird thing that happened around 2015, 16 in US politics. And I will just say one thing today, we had this professor come and give a guest talk today where he's been looking at the psychology of this. And he sort of looked at Republicans and Democrats left and right. And one of the things he found is that both left and right were actually quite good. They were sort of equally good at sort of discerning the, the really false, the truly false things. And that's sort of, that should be something that everyone should be listening to. Because again, I don't think it's left, it's not like left is better at discerning sort of false news than right. And that was a really sort of uh, interesting finding. Another finding, um, you know, with, you know, these kinds of um, left and right is that you find um, that you know there was a Pew chair, uh, uh, Pew survey that came out looking at whether young people, actually they looked at several generations, but young people was the sort of central focus, could tell the difference between fact and opinion pieces. Just that, fact and opinion. And again, that was equal to the left, to the right. We can you know, do better both on the left and the right. And so that's, that's a place that we could start teaching our kids, regardless of whether we're on the left or right, is to try to teach them to at least discern between opinion and, and, and fact. Don't teach the kids teach the parents. Yeah, that's true too, yeah. <laughs> we had another, Not just the kids, yeah. at least. Uh, we had a question back here. Could you stand up and everybody use your outdoor voice? Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. So I recently just did a piece in graduate school about um, the uh, Japanese earthquake in 2011. And Lois Appleby had published a 53-page report on how um, connecting the last mile using various means of communication would best have um, kind of absolved the problems that they have in communication in Japan. But yet, as a person in 2018, I'm raising my hand to you guys saying, Trump sent us all a text message via the White House. But maybe that's something that we need to adopt to. So what is it that most of us were so pissed off about the fact that we've gotten that text message five years later from when someone is talking about communication improvements for 2013 for Japan would have been far beyond text messaging and more about like Twitter and 
Facebook and how to get messages out faster to the mass media and to the public. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the, the emergency alert system has been trying to upgrade um, over the last few years. They, there's recommendations for using social media. I've actually been um, part of some of those conversations and those, some of those reports. Recommendations for using social media and to start to use phones rather than we used to go through radio and other things. Well, we've got to use the kinds of um, uh, communication platforms that we have. And, and so um, the, the fact that there was going to be a presidential alert, presidential alert, it's not from his, it's not from his cell phone. It, this is, it goes through the, the alert system. It's going through. It's getting vetted. Um, it's going through um, uh, our, our emergency services. Uh, the, the the reason that we got uh, up in arms about that, we being, I'm going to say that collectively, on the left, is the same reason that we, if it had been Hillary Clinton doing it, people on the right would have been uh, upset about it. Um, and we actually know that because when Obama sent something similar, people got mad about that on the right because there are people who think that they can score political points by making a big deal of it, and then we read their articles about it, and then we're like, yeah, I am mad about that. Yeah, he shouldn't be able to do that. Um, if we had just randomly seen that, I don't think it would have made anybody mad. We'd have been like, oh, this is an emergency alert, the way we've been getting emergency alerts all this time. But we had all these pundits telling us how we were supposed to interpret that. And so that's actually where we're at as a society, was we get all these people helping us. Something happens in the world, and we get, oh, we just wait, wait to, you know, whether it's Rachel Maddow or Hannity's going to tell me how I'm going to interpret that, and then I'm going to know. Um, and, and that's um, that's, I think, why why we kind of misinterpreted what that was all all about because that was really just about helping us be safe. And I don't perceive, I, I don't think that Donald Trump is going to use that for, for political means. That's silly. Let's go to a short, concise question. Yes. What is your short, concise question? What is your reliable news source? What is your reliable news source? <laughs> So one of the things I've been experimenting with, um, and this is from student Jevin, ideas. I'm standing right here. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I, I yeah, I admit, I, I'm a huge NPR follower. I Thank donated you. my car to KUOW. It was not the car with a dent, though. It was uh, even, even an older car. Um, so, so one of the things that uh, I'm finding, we were trying this experiment with students, is to to go just even to the Associated Press or to Reuters that sort of generate a lot of the news that other news before all the other news sort of sort of you know colors it and flavors it in, in any way they want. That's that's sort of one way. I always thought sort of you know if you wanted to find you know, maybe a fact if we can call it that you know I do rely on Wikipedia, but my students for some reason have been taught in high school that oh that's crowdsourced. I don't know if I can trust that. So there's this conflict, a generational conflict going on between you know, how reliable Wikipedia data is. But I would just say in terms of news sources, sort of I go there. I mean, I do admit I am a, a huge NPR follower, but I try to see a lot of the news to get a sort of broader meta picture of, of what's going on because we all know that it's colorful on the left and we know it's colorful on the right. And maybe if by putting them together and mixing them together, they sort of nullify each other. I, and I think a balanced news diet is really vital. I mean, if you're reading just from one area, you really owe it to yourself to just read the Wall Street Journal, even look at Breitbart just to see what it is that they're saying. And so you're exposed to it. If you're only exposed to one area, I think it's going to warp your perceptions. That's my view. Anything? There is something to be said for the fact that, that misinformation repeated actually has an effect on you, even if you don't think that you're going to trust it. So there is something about overexposing ourselves to information that, that might be trying to manipulate us that might not be the best. Um, I think it's it's hard to give it's hard to give prescriptions for what the right information diet is. I do know my parents are um, really really strong Fox News watchers, and they were like, "Well, we're trying to balance ourselves out, so we're going to watch MSNBC." And I thought, "This is not balance. <laughs> this is just more of the same from the other side." So yeah, th there is sort of th there is balance, but I would say that the television news is not news and it's and it's really manipulating you that's where you're getting a lot of the emotional ma manipulation but to find some of this yeah if you want to read the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal this is going to be a nice a nice balance of things but Fox News and MSNBC is not a balance David you have some advice well, I was going to say that in the digital age, there's kind of like no equivalent anymore of, say, picking up Newsweek and reading it cover to cover. And I don't think anybody's going to, like, the New York Times website and reading every single thing on that site. We're now exposed to getting our news from, like, Facebook feeds where 
you know, the Wall Street Journal sits side by side with crazy Cousin Larry's blog and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, I, I generally use Google News, which is not itself a news source, but is an aggregator, because if I see some story there that I think is important, um, and especially important to know that it's, it's accurate, well, you can, it makes it easy to read, you know, 10 or 12 different articles on the same topic from a variety of different publications. Uh, especially at times ones that are outside of the United States, like say BBC is kind of much less politicized than American reporting tends to be. But um, so advice is kind of is, is we've all been agreeing, not really one you can rely on. It's kind of and, and I will just say one thing: we we asked our students where do they get most of their news, and of course they're using uh, you know platforms I don't even know, like Instagram is already too old, and that's sort of a you know Facebook that's for the old people like me and or whatever but which is crazy to think that that's old but so many of the students are getting their their news from satire now and parody and and not and both even left and right but I mean uh, you know we mostly engage um, with you know a lot of our students are from the left and they sort of engage with places like you know the Daily Show and, and John Oliver show and things like that but there's all sorts of satire and more and more of the young generation just uses satire now for the another news. short concise question yeah. what is it how does your work Access. And by that I mean that the government has eliminated a lot of facts from the websites. Facts. How does your work include absence, a lack of information? Information has been removed from government. Yeah, I'll websites. just say one quick thing. We use the Wayback Machine. So if no one's ever used the Internet Archive or the Wayback Machine, <laughs> I hear some. I hear some fans back Could there. Could you explain what it is? Yeah. So, so yeah. the Internet Archive or the Wayback Machine is a beautiful tool that we have out there. Um, it gobbles everything that's out there at all times and keeps a timestamp. So you can go back and look at websites in the 1990s and see how things were presented. And there are organizations that are going and collecting a lot of the data, you know, government data too, to have sort of a backup. But I would try if you've never gone to the Wayback Machine, uh, you know, or from the Internet Archive, do it. It's a lot of fun. You get to see sort of time marching on on certain sites and certain topics. A question back here, sir. Could you shout it out? Do you have to make a comment about the 37% that was actually 37.281? Yeah. A question about the 37%, could you explain? Yeah, I mean, numbers numbers carry authority. So if I said that, uh, you know, 2,139 DACA recipients have been convicted of crime, that's weighty and that's scary, and that's something that sort of, you know, is intimidating. So I think one of the things that we always do to students when we hear those numbers is to have them be presented in context. So actually that number is a real number that was reported and it actually turns out that one third of 1% of DACA recipients have been convicted of a crime whereas 8.6% of Americans have been convicted. So it's the anytime you hear those numbers, always ask to have them in context. Yes, sir. The, all of you sound like you're saying that facts matter and facts are discernible. There are such things as facts. But Kate, you hinted at RT obscuring that and making us doubt that there are such things. And on the flip side, Henry Frankfurt in a nice little book said that bullshitting is a person saying whatever is necessary to persuade regardless of what the facts are, the facts are irrelevant. And what's your question? Are we moving toward that? Is there a danger that instead of fact-based information, it's just all persuasion? Is the entire notion of fact-based information kind of going by the wayside because it's all about persuasion now? Yeah. No, the, the 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 hard thing is the. I don't want to get bogged down in the semantics, but the obsession with facts also can be hard because fact the same. People can display facts or present facts in a lot of different ways to tell different narratives. You can actually use five facts to to completely uh, give a false narrative and have people not believing the right thing, um, and so. I'm not sure facts is the right word, but I'm also not sure truth is the right word because people can argue whether there's an objective truth or, or not as well. Um, but the, the thing that I will say is that we know from strategic um, uh, some historical strategies of disinformation that one of the goals of disinformation is not to confuse you of anything. It's to have you 
uh, sorry, not to convince you of everything, it's to confuse you so you don't know where you can go for trusted information with this idea that people that do not know where they can go for tr trusted information are easy to manipulate. That a society that can't come together around a shared reality is one that disintegrates or literally disintegrates and can't come together when there is something, there is a threat that they need to rally against. They can't rally against it because they've disintegrated. And I think that is kind of the goal of disinformation. So when we're seeing like, you can't trust anything and everybody has their own reality and you know, don't, you know, you can't trust experts or anything else. That kind of rhetoric and that kind of way of engaging in the world that we're actually in some ways encouraging when we tell people you can't trust the, the media. Well, yeah, you, you can't, but when you get to where you can't trust anything, you're, 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 you're weak as a society. It's actually, it undermines democracy by doing. By and, doing I, that. I, and I was just going to say that it's a concern I have when I talk to younger um, uh, younger kids. So everyone's like, go talk to high schools and middle schools, and I am, but I don't want to give them a sense that they have to to be skeptical of everything and, and create a bunch of nihilists. And I think I think that um, you know, for uh, you know, when I looked at science, I told you my real my my sort of foyer into this was through studying science. And despite all the problems with science, and we've got lots of them, we still fly in 747s. We still have vaccines. We still have cell phones that you know you can use and do powerful things, it still kind of works. And that empirical method that we use in science is really powerful. So if we can sort of convey that to the public, hopefully that'll be one way. And one thing I will say about Harry Frankfurt, if you don't have the On Bullshit book, it's a great stocking stuffer, and, he, and he's great about teaching you a little bit about, you know, from a philosopher's standpoint, what a liar is and what a bullshitter is. Okay, one last question back here. Um, of all the social media platforms, I guess mainstream social media platforms, which is the most vulnerable to disinformation? Which mainstream media platform is most vulnerable to disinformation? David? Yeah. Of course, I have to admit I don't have a lot of familiarity with all of the social media platforms. Um, I mean, the one that we most frequently deal with is Facebook, uh, just because probably it's the biggest, it's the most popular. Um, you know, it's it's been targeted by purveyors of disinformation, and until recently they weren't doing a whole lot about it. So, um, at least in my experience, that is. But I said I can't speak to what happens on Instagram or anything like that that we don't use. Jeff and Arcade, do you have an opinion about which which is most vulnerable to misinformation? I would say they're, they're all vulnerable in different ways. I think we are most vulnerable on, on Facebook right now, we as a society, because Facebook is the most used. It's one that we we there in this in this way that's wrapped up in social information, and yet it's giving us a lot of um, uh, news and political information. And so I think right now that we're most vulnerable there. Facebook has the most resources to address the problem compared to a lot of the other platforms, and they're working on it. And so I wouldn't say these are permanent permanent situations, but the problem is new platforms are going to arise and will be newly vulnerable in, in those as well unless the platforms begin to kind of approach their initial design with the idea of not like, you know, best, let's assume best intent, but actually thinking about how can, you know, how can this go wrong from the beginning of how they're designing these platforms is how might these be used by people that want to manipulate us and, and start from there. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll just say one thing. The internet platform, the social media platforms that concern me the most are the ones where the newest internet users in the world use most often. And one of those, one very popular one is WhatsApp, owned by Facebook. And you maybe have read about a lot of the mob activity going on, killing people based on misinformation in India and places like that. And their platform used to allow you to spread to as, you know, X number of people. And now they've realized they've limited that. So those kinds of things are helping. But it's, there are so many new internet users coming on every single day. We're talking millions every year, and it's those people that we should really try to help at least acquaint with this really polluted digital world we live in now. Oh, yeah, and one more, YouTube, sorry. Yeah, YouTube is <laughs> YouTube really has bad. been under, under recognized for its role, but YouTube is just the way the recommendation algorithms work. I don't use YouTube as a user very much, but people, we've seen a lot of radicalization of different kinds happen on YouTube just through the recommendations, and so I think that's one where we're really vulnerable as well. I want to leave some time for some person-to-person -person interaction. Kate Starbird looks at Miss Misinformation after disasters. Jevin West's class on misinformation is calling bullshit. And of course, you're probably familiar with Snopes. David Mickelson is the founder of that. Let's give them a warm round of applause.
And thank you for all coming out today. This is great. This is the kind of dialogue we need. So thanks. Hey, how do we all get class? Yeah, you could do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do a big MOOC. So it'll be a